Hi, I'm Chris Pryor. I'm the team leader for the Rafter Radiocarbon Laboratory here at GNS Science. This is the sample preparation laboratory for radiocarbon dating and today we're going to show you a little bit about how radiocarbon dating is done. So how does radiocarbon dating work? It's actually pretty simple. All living things contain carbon and there are three naturally occurring isotopes of carbon. Carbon 12, 13, and 14. Carbon-14 is naturally radioactive. It's formed in the upper atmosphere through the interaction of cosmic rays with nitrogen, nitrogen atoms, and that carbon-14 that's been formed is rapidly oxidized as carbon dioxide and gets incorporated into the atmosphere. Plants take it up from the atmosphere as CO, so the C14 is rapidly mixed throughout the environment. Actually, there's a lot more carbon-12 and carbon-13 in living organisms than carbon-14, but all living things are naturally radioactive because they contain carbon-14. As long as an organism is living and breathing and taking in food, then it's in equilibrium with its environment and it has a constant ratio of 12 to 13 to 14. When an organism dies, it's no longer taking in any new carbon, so at that point the carbon-14 in the organism begins to decay away. That's kind of like the start of the stopwatch for radiocarbon dating. If we can accurately and precisely measure how much C14 is in our sample now, we know how much should have been in the sample when it was alive, we can then use an equation to calculate how much time has passed since that organism was alive, and that's radiocarbon dating. Of course, the tricky part is being able to accurately and precisely measure how much C14 is left, and that's where all the effort in the laboratory comes in. So the types of materials that we normally radiocarbon date include things like wood, plant remains, uh, charcoal from charred wood, animal products like bone or leather or sinew or horn or antler or um, skin, you know, parchment. Also, art archaeological artifacts that are made from plants and animals. The types of things we can't radiocarbon date are geological materials, so we can't date stone or glass. And we also can't date some things that are beyond the dating range of radiocarbon. We can only radiocarbon date back to about 50,000 years ago because of the half-life of radiocarbon, which is 5,730 years. After about 10 half-lives, which would be 57,000 years, the amount of C14 that was originally in that organism is so tiny that we can't really accurately and precisely measure it with most of the radiocarbon dating equipment in laboratories around the world. A typical example of the type of thing we date in our laboratory is this textile. The client sent it to us hoping that it is 1,500 years old or possibly older, but what he really wants to do is make sure that it's not a modern fake. We look at it first under the microscope and what we're looking for is um, identification to see if the sample is what it's supposed to be. We also look under the microscope in order to uh, look for any, cont any contaminants that have been added to the outside of the sample that we want to remove. The second step in the process is a chemical cleaning of the sample because what we want to do is isolate carbon that is just from the sample and not from any ex external contaminating materials. So what you see here is people doing a lot of chemical processes to clean up the sample. In, in the textile example that we've been talking about, we're going to give it a series of washes with organic solvents, and those solvents will dissolve any greases or fats that have been uh, attached to the sample by people handling it with their fingers. The next step is to convert the solid sample to carbon dioxide, and then to convert the carbon dioxide to graphite which for measurement in the accelerator. We load the sample into a quartz combustion tube with copper oxide and a little bit of silver wire. Then we put that combustion tube on a vacuum line and we pump all of the air out of the tube. When all of the air has been sucked out of the tube, we can flame seal it and that leaves a vacuum on the inside. Once the sample has been sealed into an evacuated combustion tube, it's put into a muffle furnace and heated to 900 degrees. 
the copper oxide will cause the solid sample to combust, to burn, and will end up at the end of the process after it's been combusting overnight with carbon dioxide and a little bit of water inside the combustion tube. The, the combustion tube is cracked and the CO2 is transferred through these traps into a small bottle. The first trap is a water trap and the second trap is where we collect the CO2. The CO2 is, the volume of the CO2 is then measured very exactly so that we know how much we got and then the next, then it's transferred into this small bottle here. The final step in the process is making graphite. What we do is attach this little bottle with containing the CO2 to the vacuum line over here and that CO2 is mixed with hydrogen inside a graphite reaction vessel. There's a small amount of iron powder inside the reaction vessel which is what we call the catalyst. When the hydrogen and the CO2 are heated to a high temperature, the, CO the hydrogen will take the oxygens off the CO2 and deposit elemental carbon in the form of graphite on the iron catalyst. A tiny amount of graphite is the end product from the sample preparation laboratory. And now we're taking the graphite from the sample preparation laboratory into the accelerator room for measurement. Albert Zondervan, the accelerator operations team leader, and his team take over the measurement from this point on. The graphite is pressed into an aluminum target holder, and that target holder is placed into this wheel, which has 40 positions on it. In the wheel, 25 of the positions are unknown samples, and the remaining positions are graphites that are made from standards and blanks, materials that allow us to determine our quality assurance and how to calculate the age. At this point, the wheel is placed into the ion source. The source is a cesium beam that blasts the carbon out of its target holder and into the accelerator. The stream of carbon ions goes through the accelerator being bent at certain places by magnets which serve to separate out the carbon 12, 13, and 14 into separate streams. The carbon 12 and 13 are separated out at this point and the carbon 14 continues on through the accelerator to this point where it is detected. Once the data has been analyzed on the accelerator, then we have to calculate a radiocarbon age. The information that comes off the accelerator is actually a ratio of the carbon-14 to carbon-13, and we have to use a calculation, an equation, to calculate a radiocarbon age. A radiocarbon age is, actually, is always reported with a plus or minus error, and that plus or minus error means that the radiocarbon age can fall anywhere within that full radio age span. So because a radiocarbon age is not the same as a calendar year, we have to use calibration to convert the radiocarbon age to a calendar age span. In this particular case, the radiocarbon age intercepts the calibration curve at two different locations. The majority of the intercept falls within this area here, which is about 400 to 350 BC. But because the outer bounds of the, calen of the radiocarbon age range intercepts the part of the curve that comes up here, there is a small but significant possibility that the calendar age of the sample could be in the 280 to 230 years BC age range as well. So, while we're not able to determine an exact specific calendar year for this textile, we know that the radiocarbon age range converts to a calendar age range which shows that it is indeed an antique textile and not a modern forgery. I hope our client's happy with the result.